sectors. So quick, uh, as you said that the conversation is all around building an AI ecosystem for the world, right? And as you understand, as you know, many of you know that AI stands for artificial intelligence, which is essentially figuring out how uh, machines can imitate some of our thinking, imitate some of our uh, decision-making processes, uh, and so on, and sort of enable us to make decisions uh, and assist and assist us in figuring out the world around us. Uh, perhaps much more quicker than we can because they are scalable. They have a lot more memories and memories and computes than you do. Um, just give me one second. Perfect. Uh, I am going in the full mode now. The screen is visible. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So, a uh, quick disclaimer. Uh, Shukriti did a far better job in explaining my background, but this is all around explaining what the context is. Um, I'm old enough for those who recognize. Uh, I've been around Internet 1.0 and 2.0. Uh, when uh, some of my colleagues I can see from New Jersey, Dr. Bhatia, who was a researcher at IBM, a uh, very distinguished gentleman, uh, one of the early distinguished researchers at IBM, when he spoke about data connections in when I was at the University of Maryland, I was part of DARPA's advanced um, connectivity uh, a network and we were dialing each other at 1.2 kilobytes. So I've seen that world. I have seen the internet 2.0 world, which is coming now. I uh, looked at about uh, 700 users in the emerging markets, which is uh, goes anywhere between um, Brazil and Papua New Guinea. When I worked for Facebook, I looked at 79 markets globally, um, user behavior in and around uh, 700 people, uh, both been startup and academics, and that has enabled me to uh, sort of generalize some of the understandings, right? Give me one second. Okay, perfect. So uh, just give me one second. There's an icon that keeps, uh, um, because I'm the moderate, I'm the uh, host, I'm getting all this permission for the waiting room. Is there a way, Shukriti, you can just give me the, uh, take, uh, make me co-host so that I don't have to keep letting people in? Actually, okay, you are on mute. Uh, you are the co-host. I'm letting people, everyone in, so you can carry forward with your presentation. Oh, you are letting everyone in? Cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Okay. Okay, perfect. Then I'll be myself. You take care of it. I'll be myself and yeah. chat. Uh, yeah, what I, I enjoy, I enjoy solving for India class data problems. What does India class data problem mean? Because I was just pausing and letting people in. What does India class data problem mean, right? Um, in India, I work for a telco. Uh, there's a restriction. Uh, there's a restriction called photos for SIM card application must have white background, white wall background. Indian definition of a wall is someone holding a uh, white sheet behind you. There's a customer who you put on the floor, so then we can take the white floor as his background and take his picture, right? And there's a guy who is squatting near a bus, so then we can see the background as a white. Now, believe it or not, one of my challenges is actually going and figure out which one of this is using algorithms, which one of this is actual one versus which one is not, and letting those pass as a, uh, a picture that's eligible for giving a SIM card, because that you are required by law to do that. So that's my India class data problem. India, as you know, is a one nation, uh, 122 major languages, 1600 dialects, a lower middle income, limited speed, but yet a big luxury market. Uh, smartphones grew. The 2020 growths are minimal, but grew 19% in 2019. Yet you are a feature phone country. So what is really India class problem? I sort of gave you an example, funny examples of what people interpret instructions as and how you have to disambiguate, have to figure out the data behind it, right? But what does it really mean? It really means two things, right? It's the planetary scale data and is the consumer behavior. So consumer behavior is just a glimpse of what you saw. What does it mean to be a planetary scale data? So just, I'll give you an example of uh, what the planetary scale data means. We have at Airtel 300 million plus customers who daily consume 100 petabytes of uh, data. And then to put it, that in context, it's about 2 billion hours of high definition video. That's the equivalent of data they consume every day. From that, we are collecting about 500 billion events. An event means when you make a phone call and I collect that record, that's an event. Uh, you start a data session, that's an event. You make a recharge on your phone, it's an event. Uh, your phone connects to another tower, that's an event. 500 billion events every day, that's half a trillion events. I have to actually compute stuff 
on half a billion stuff every day. Um, so the question is, you know, I understand that in the US, you know, things are very, very sort of advanced. People have, you know, connectivities everywhere. You can take your cell phone everywhere. Um, there's security cameras everywhere and we can collect that kind of data. But what does people do in India to generate that kind of a data? So those who are from Bangalore, you can raise hand. I will not see it, but those who are from Bangalore, one of my favorite activities going around and taking picture to demonstrate to people that how things happen in India. This is a market in a place called Mardiola in Bangalore. As you can see, it's a, a sort of a um, vegetable market. At first uh, view, it doesn't look like there's anything in there. But if you go there, there's a security camera on the top left side. You can see in the, in the center of the circle, there's a security camera right there behind the onions. There's a security camera. There's a third camera hanging from the roof in the back. There's a fourth camera hanging from right behind the calendar. Um, if you can see the calendar behind the calendar, there's a yellow dot in the yellow uh, like cover. And beyond that, you can see the camera, right? Now think of it this way. A small 7-Eleven store has about as much cameras in the USA as this small shack in India does, right? And if you're thinking that this, all this camera is sort of for a show and nothing really happens with that, here is the big deal. Here's your data center. He actually has a recording devices and a bunch of uh, pen drives and all of that stuff along with gods and goddesses picture. That's your data center. So you are actually generating a massive amount of data in the country every day. As you said, in terms of consumption, it's about 100 petabytes. In terms of just one telco collecting that data, it's about 500 million records. So once you collect the data, what happens? What are the characteristics of that data, right? It's India data. The complexity in and around is India data is it's non-standard or unstructured. It's incomplete. It's incorrect. And very often it's all of them. Um, I'll explain all of them uh, in, a, in a bit. Those who are uh, both electrical engineers and both lived in India, I will understand that this is what exactly India class data problem looks like. There are hundreds of wires. If you had to apply any electrical engineering principles like Karshoff's law on this network, you would not be able to do that because it looks like a mess, right? It's, and that's India. In a, in, a, in a nutshell, that picture tells you what India class data is all about. Now let's go to the actual examples. As I said, one of my uh, habits is being a traveling photographer. I go every corner, take pictures, right? So this is in old Delhi. I don't know how many, uh, Mr. Bansal, you are probably from Delhi. I'm not sure if they're originally from Delhi or not. You are. Okay. All right. The smile tells me. Smile yeah, tells I'm me. From, yeah, I'm from North. Yeah. So uh, this is in, um, this is in the, uh, yeah, the thing, uh, Mahalakshmi market, otherwise known as Chandi Chowk. Um, if uh, this is, you have to just take by the thing that these are three houses in the, in one corner, right? I could not get enough space. It's narrow lane. So if you look at the addresses, 1880 slash 13 dash M16 is one. The next one is M15. The one that next to it is 1850 slash W2, right? Now, if you put any computer system to disambiguate it, no one will tell you in the US, if you go to houses, it'll be 1858, 1860, 1862. Not a mathematical enigma, but not a mathematical puzzle, right? Um, in if you and this is actually easy in Calcutta, for example, which is where I lived for some time, a house might have been called 16, 16 Bankim Bihari Road. They got divided among two brothers. Now it's 16 A and B, which sold it to someone else, the upper floor. So it will say 16 dash A dash one, who in turn sold it to someone. Say it was a 16 dot A dash one slash B F, and you have no idea what you know, you know what system they are following to sort of designate these numbers, right? So that sounds funny, but what does it do? Um, I'm just talking about address data because and I'll show you in, a, in about 10, 15 minutes why that's sort of very, very important. Um, addresses are actually one of the fundamental requirements of being in a modern nation, right? You have your name, your identity, and your address. These are the three things that defines everything from where you live, play, work, earn, all of that stuff, right? So in India, addresses come in multiple formats, buildings name, standard, street name, standard, 
a lot of it comes from points of interest. People will say behind Dominus Pizza, next to Ganesha Temple, uh, be, beside SBI ATM. All sounds good, hunky dory. Problem is there are a lot of similar sounding in here. Amrit Nagar versus Amrit Nagar in Mumbai. There are three Rattalas in Calcutta, right? And people have evolving sense of distance. Next two can mean this, and these are actually taken from hundreds and thousands of data at a company who we worked at delivery. We have to deliver packages efficiently. Um, next to means anything from really next to, which is 1858 is next to 1860, sort of in the general vicinity, right? With the median distance was 80 meters. Um, next to SBI can mean, so the delivery's own office was next to uh, um, Gurgaon Ramada. What it means is you take the street next to Gurgaon Ramada, make the next left, It'll go about 50 meters and that's where it was. Now, it gets even more interesting when you say near. Near uh, Green Park Metro in Delhi. The near has a definition of about 1.8 kilo, uh, kilometer radius, which actually boils it down to a 10 square kilometer. Now, imagine telling someone who has come to deliver for the first time, who is not a postman, who has not lived in that area forever. Say so that go find near Metro, Green Park Metro, right? Now, it gets even more interesting in tier two and tier three towns. This is a, and I, I come from a tier three town. It's a state capital, right? Um, Agartala, but most of the addresses. Near main clock tower, west ka chautha gali, Raj medical store mein jake pucho bablu ka ghar hai. Which essentially says uh, in English people who are not Hindi speakers, and they have the main clock tower, fourth lane on the west, and you have to say west, because W-A-S-T is the spelling, enter the lane, you have to know Raj Medical is M-A-D-I-C-L-E, it's a store. And then sort of go there and ask and the guy from there will show you the house, right? And this is just in tier two, tier three towns. If you look at uh, beyond that, tier four towns and smaller towns and uh, you know villages, it gets wild. So I'll give you the um, my real addresses. Like I have house in a tier two town, which is College Tilagatala. My brother's house in 7116 via Corridor Drive, Austin. You type in the US 7116 Vaya Corridor Drive, it tells you his front parking, uh, you know, literally it puts in his house. You put College Till Agartala in Google right now, it shows you the city of Agartala, which is about, you know, uh, 76 square kilometer, right? It's got about a radius of about, I think, five kilometers. It's a small town. It just tells you the whole town. So if you uh, do a Google map in Agartala and anything in College Till in my neighborhood, just resolve to 76 square meter. Beyond that, it's your duty to find out where it is. Now, if you say that and the College Tila is Tila is mound, it has a bunch of lakes. So it has a lake called College Tila Lake. If you say next to College Tila Lake or near College Tila, Google gets better. It resolves it down to just about three kilometers. Now you have to go around and ask people who have our houses, right? What does it do? It actually leads to great deal of inefficiency, right? When um, I joined delivery in 2015, after coming back from the US most of my life, um, what they used to do, they used to do a pin code level sorting. What it means that um, you take a pin code like Gurgaon, um, 122001. So by the way, uh, I would have run a quiz had it been this thing. Um, people who know Gurgaon, it's a you know, municipal of about 2 million people. It's one of India's smartest cities. Uh, there are 18 pin codes. Most Gurgaon residents cannot tell me that, you know, when I take the poll, cannot guess, no one can guess, it, the usual guesses are two, three, and four. It has 18 pin codes. And 68% of the people write the pin code as 122001. At a nation, national level, 40% people write their pin codes wrong. So when you do a pin code level sorting, you are only getting 60% of the things first time right, which is you are bringing it to Gurgaon, right? And if you instead of Gurga, if you, and you know, it leaves a bunch of other signals, so it's not really that bleak. It's more about 70, 75%. But when you try to do the Gurga resolution, right? Now you have got it in a big uh, area and your router guy who's driving around, he's going around about 104 kilometer route every day. He's tired, he is uh, inefficient, and he's only delivered about 20 packages, right? Because it came to one center. When you build the systems at delivery, for address, what you call is address disambiguation, which took a bunch of signals, right, to um, boil it down to narrower area, all of a sudden it became very efficient. If you look at those tiny circles, right, those are each of them become local delivery centers. And from local delivery centers, people are doing only about 20 kilometers in each route. 
So as a result of that, they could do the 104 kilometer guy could only do one round, takes him about seven, eight hours. He delivers 22 packages in a day. The guy who is doing the 22 kilometer route, he can do three. He can go in the you know, morning, do early morning deliveries, come back, have a you know, quick meal, quick breakfast uh, at the center. He can go for a second round, come back by three, uh, and then go for, you know, have his lunch. And then he can go for the last and go home. He was delivering on an average, although it was a much, you know, driving about 66 kilometers, but he was drive, giving about, he was handing out about 35 packages. So it's a 34% increase in the productivity while reducing the cost by almost about 40%. So what can the addressing problem uh, provide, right? We just showed you that it's a better routing for e-commerce product, which is obvious. It could also be a finding out all about your customers, right? And that's very non-obvious. Why knowing your customer's address perfectly gives you a better idea about your addresses, right? So you face that at Airtel big time. We have eight business units, um, you know, prepaid SIM cards, postpaid SIM cards, broadband, DTH. Airtel has a bank called Airtel uh, Payments Bank. It has a music app called Wink and so on, right? So once you have those addresses and each of them collect their addresses in you know, their unique way. So when you collect it in that way, you sort of have to figure out who the, you essentially say that, look, everyone is a different individual. So the guy may be blowing like, you know, a great deal of money on a postpaid, but because he has a prepaid, and if he happens to call from that prepaid number to the call center, we don't provide him with a great customer service or a platinum customer service because we don't know it's one person who has a different account. So there are multiple ways you do that. We do device identified. So if you are connecting on your, for example, home Wi-Fi, then you sort of know that it's you. Um, your social handles, company home addresses, email, ad ID cookies, IP sessions, and all that stuff. But physical address turns out to be one of our biggest sort of uh, disambiguation. Again, the same enter, right? This is again Delhi. 138 Defense Enclave Vikas Mark um, is the first address on the postpaid. On the DTH, it says house number 138. So it sounds reasonable, but a computer doesn't know whether 138 and a house number 138 is the same entity. A human understands, right? The third one says 138F slash F, and those are F slash F, and those are from Delhi. You know that that's a standard for first floor, right? But the computer system now has to know that 138, house number 138, 138 comma F slash F are the same entity. And that's only in Delhi in one locality, in one address. The number of ways the house numbers are written in India uh, I'll ask you to guess, but you'd never be able to guess. 27 defined ways a house number written. Slash, house number, villa, townhouse, uh, uh, hash, right? Um, H, um, house number as in word, house hash as in word, 27 different ways. Um, defense enclave. So, uh, you know, small things, defense enclave and defense, the third one wrote defense as D-I-F-E-N-C, small thing. But look at this. One says Vikas Mark. The second says opposite Rasdani Enclave and third versus near Main Road. A computer again has to figure out that these are the same entities, right? But once you've done all this figuring out, we have a similarity score of 96%. Guess what happens? All of a sudden, we know who our customers are. 34 accounts that we have had and there are 34 defined ways we're treating people. We now know who the head eaters are, right? There is Mr. and these are just by this, so that these are not customer names. The numbers are real, but the customer names have been randomly changed or randomly created. So Mr. Nitin Suri, Surender Kumar, Singh, and so on. All of these are large customers, but if you looked at, for example, uh, Nitin Suri's 299 rupees DTH account, if you call from the DTH, for DTH, which is the dish that where you get the satellite TV, right? it's actually on the smallest accounts. He would have actually gotten treated as a small tier customer, it's like a you know, bronze tier customer and gotten into a regular line where he'd have waited for half an hour. Now that we know he spends so much money with us, he would automatically get put in a platinum line because now you know his total spend. That he might look tiny in one area, but he's actually a heavy eater for the company, right? And that gives you a very, very good view of customers. What does that do? It, are this all real or these are like random examples I'm picking up? So I. Uh, as I mentioned before, I work with MIT or, you know, we actually looked at this. We measured how much it is on a, just an India basis, just solving one problem using AI, which is the address. 
will actually lift the GDP by about 0.3 to 0.4 percent. There's not one line item in India other than the national highway toll that actually have that much impact. And implementing it would be much cheaper than just, you know, putting the electric toll gates on national highways, right? Uh, uh, 10 to 12 billion dollars a year. Uh, as I said, 35 percent productivity improvement in just, you know, and that delivery, that's because delivery does it because we built it and it's proprietary stuff, right? But if you take it nationwide, things will get much more efficient. Um, that's sort of the India first trend, right? Which is just looking at the messy data in India can give you massive economic benefit. The second thing that I see, right, is that you and I and first 300 million people on the internet in India, right, are lucky. We actually know how to read and write English. We can type English. We have a reasonable conf confidence of sort of being correct with our English, right? Just give me one second. Bigger than English and so on, right? But the next billion are the ones that are from my hometown, right? They are more familiar with local languages. They can understand English, but when it comes to speaking English, they're not very comfortable. Uh, they can type, but they are, for example, afraid of making a mistake in the spelling. So they're very hesitant in typing, right? So the next one billion is not going to the online with an interface like you and I know, which is Dutch, right? Which is, you know, um, uh, touch, which is, you know, either you type on a smartphone or you type on a computer and so on and so on, right? They are going to come on internet using the voice. So we already have started building what you call as the Indic language voice bots. So what it does is understands Indian languages. Indian language is a bunch of challenges. First of all, uh, three or four challenges that we'll talk about. Uh, first of all, there are many languages, 120. Uh, second thing, we mix languages, right? So in the same sentence, we start saying, you know, say Hindi and English, right? If you're Bengali, you'll mix in one sentence, Bengali, Hindi and English, right? Um, the third thing is a Bengali, what is say in Hindi spoken by a Gujarati versus a Marathi versus a Telugu guy versus a Haryanvi and versus God forbid Bengali like myself, sounds like five different languages. It's actually not, it's completely different than each other. So just even figuring out Hindi, right? So what it did, we actually did something very, very interesting to go solve that problem. And I'll tell you, I'll give you a small example. This is not our example. I sort of feeling biased that I'm taking all Airtel examples. Uh, this is the way it works, right? You actually speak. Just say, you know, Mumbai se Delhi, dhai baje jana hai. Next train chahiye. Mumbai se Delhi, agli mahine, do tarik ko, dhai baje. Right, etc. So it actually figures out. And um, at Airtel, we have been able to solve it um, pretty well. And that was an interesting trick. We tried forever trying to get what is known as the training data. So, what happens in AI, one of the concepts is their training, right? You train it like a child. So, for example, supervised learning, when you teach a child saying that that's a chair and that's a table, that you know, the child knows the chair has four legs and then he knows. The table also has four legs. So sometimes he makes a mistake because the uh, this is your you know one you know 14 month old child, right? He calls a chair a table. Then you say, no, no, chair has a back, the table doesn't. So that's are the reference points that a computer that is the same way a machine learning system learns. This is called supervised learning, right? But for you, you need a lot of training data. So how do you provide training data? What you did, we have huge call centers, so you automatically give them script, right? To read. And that training data failed miserably. And guess why? Because in real life, when you call a call center in India, and this is for providing call center service, in the US, you are uh, sitting like Dr. Vatia in a quiet room, no sound in the background, uh, or in an office, no sound in the background. Here, uh, my typical median user is, as I said, the gentleman called Bablu in Mirat, sitting in a punch shop on the roadside. There are cars honking, there's a goat bleating next to him. There is a child crying with a mom, and there's a man arguing next to you, right? And on top of that, Mr. Bablu, when someone else comes to his shop, he said, Bhaiya Ruko, and then he chit chats with him, why my call center guy is holding. And you have to know that Q, Bhaiya Ruko means, right, you know, and sometimes you don't say, say it, you start talking to someone else, right? So all this context is massively complex, right? No one has an office, right? 90% of our users don't have an office. Uh, background noise, I can say, take enough on traffic, 
you know, gold bleating, people arguing, but when you mix all of this stuff, it becomes impossible. And the trick, it took us almost a year to figure out how to do it. And guess what you ended up doing? And I don't think if I had a running quiz, anyone would be able to do that. We actually started looking at the purpose of all India radio. We realized that going back to 1960s, when then the, the rule about you know, state language and all this came, all India radio had to read out newses, news at all languages. So they would actually get a local tone of a Bengali guy in Tripura reading a Hindi news, and I'll get that Hindi tone on him, right? They will cover an event on the road, and I'll get that background noise. So it took all the radio and TV purpose data. So if someone is covering a news event on the road, you'll see it on Delhi, something happened, an accident happened, there's a TV guy running there, and that corpus data was a real life data. Unless it's messy, non-structured, incorrect, and all of them at the same time, you would not be able to train any data in India. I mean, you could give, forget machine learning, even God can, cannot do it. Right? So what does all of it eventually boils down to? Uh, what you have started doing, and it's not, you know, we have started building what I call as the AI integrated assistance. Part, you know, the objective of it is to essentially provide far more, um, you know, speedy and far more accurate and far more sort of customized support to our customers. Uh, so the AI, these are AI integrated assistants called decision trees. Uh, so the version one of decision tree was essentially a rule-based engine. It was not an AI-based engine. The decision tree 2.0 will essentially drive, it will make decisions about um, the customers, you know, how a customer needs to be, when a customer is saying. So one of the most common things you hear in a call center, the guy says, and I'll use Hindi because it is a bit more dramatic. Apologies to people who don't understand Hindi. It's like, where uh, Subhay say internet nature, right? So first question, in depending on how rural the area is, he said, uh, internet phone me internet WhatsApp chal raha WhatsApp chal raha Facebook bhi chal raha internet kaam nahi kar Data kaam nahi kar right? So what he says, data nature, right? Guess what it means? He's not able to watch YouTube or when TikTok lasted, which means he's having issues with YouTube. He's having an issue with the speed, right? It's not that he's not been able to access data at all. So WhatsApp works in very low latency and very low bandwidth. It's a marvelous product, but your YouTube and your TikTok doesn't work, right? But if you took that as a, uh, literally as the, your data is not working, you'll end up diagnosing for about 30 minutes. You'll ask him to turn on the data, turn on the data, turn on the data, turn on the data, and every time he'll come back and say, no, data is not working, right? So all of this learning has to be embedded in the assistant, which means said, if a guy is calling from a village near Gaya, it literally means that he's having one, we have, you know, 2G data there. He's not having data means he actually has less bandwidth on the data than anything else. So um, now I'll talk about, I talked about two trends, right? One, I talked about the massive amount of data, right? We're generating unprecedented amount of data. The second trend I talked about, as an interface, India is going to replace the screen very, very quickly, faster than any other country. And that boards an entire different way of doing business. When you're not what I'd call it constrained by a screen, your screen is actually a constraint. You have to type it within a second certain area, you have to have certain abilities to do uh, transact and so on. But once even your transactions are taken over by your voice, you just say, I want to buy a data pack of 49 rupees and it gets done automatically. You have actually taken out a lot and a lot of constraints, right? The third one is one of the remarkable things that I saw in India is what I call as the India stack. The India stack is the informal name on which, or actually formal name on which India's payments and identity and all the systems are getting built, right? And this is the remarkable how quickly it has gone up. Um, in five years, past five years, 99% Indians have an identity. Uh, 350 million plus have a new bank account, which means they have never been banked, but they came to our banking system. We actually do 6 million people. We intake 6 million people every day, at every month at Airtel, which is essentially 200,000 people every day. And it's mostly done by other, you know, authentication. So you bring in the, your identity, we authenticate it within, I think about 20 or 30 seconds, everything is done. And within what used to be a four day process in about two hours, you have a new connection. Okay. Um, that has remarkably changed all aspects and not only getting a SIM card, 
it's getting a SIM card, getting an additional identity like a driver's license and all. So anything and everything is now sort of being driven by uh, the new identity called Aadhaar. The second one is even more remarkable, which is Unified Payment Interface, UPI. In December 9, 2019, UPI actually did more transactions than all the credit cards did in, did in past years, past 18 years collectively, right? If you look at uh, credit card and debit cards at POS and then um, uh, the uh, and then all other cards so all forms of cards combined in 18 years was exceeded by you know so what it also does if you look at the shop which i showed in Mariola, he can sell you literally two tomatoes for 20 rupees you can pull out your phone you can scan a barcode and you can pay him instantly right compare that to the other countries right in the united states you have to largely have to have a card you try to pay by phone your visa and other cards are embedded in your phone so you can do an nfc transaction but you cannot just scan a barcode. I can get literally, I should have had the vending machine a picture. After this, uh, we just realized that we are, have a lockdown in Bangalore. Um, we don't have ice cream at home. I can walk down to a, essentially a box, scan a QR code, open that box, get ice cream and pay for it instantly. So what does that do? This is what I call a blind scale system. This thing works in India, right? It works in India means it will work anywhere. When I used to run emerging market products at Facebook, so as I said, 79 countries between um, you know, Brazil and Papua New Guinea, or when I give the stock. Most interestingly, the guy, when I give the address stock, typically the uh, first guy who will come in the audience to talk to me, and this is all COVID, pre-COVID, would be someone from Indonesia and said, you just described Indonesia to me. We have the same problem. Or a guy in Kenya who says, look, this is, did you take some data from, do you want to take some data from Nairobi and help me out, right? India is a template for the emerging market. So there is right now the world, you know, there's a common consciousness in the world, CI is getting into two poles, you know, two poles. One is the US poll, uh, funded by government, um, research from Stanford, MIT, et cetera, et cetera, Google, et cetera. The second poll is China which is government mandated data collection for everything from your facial recognition, emotion recognition, everything, right? And then just essentially forced down on the, um, the rest of the population. My hypothesis has always been that there's a third model, which is the India model, which is highly decentralized. You know, it's a uh, thing where the data is extremely messy. The US data scientist would have a very hard time understanding the context of this data, let alone understanding, you know, going and solving that problem. When you say, so for example, very simple, photographs must have a white background. No one will think about verifying white wall background. That, that's something that you have to verify, right? In India, you'll know that the 80% or at least the 20, 30% of the people who don't have a wall will figure out a way to get you the wall, right? And you have to sort of, not because it's fun going and figure out what's a real wall, wall or not, but I'm required to do that before giving a SIM card, right? Um, so that messy, unstructured data where tons and tons of computes are needed, right? And very, very innovative stuff is needed. That's going to emerge out of India. That's my strong bet. And you're starting to see the first generation of AI companies starting to solve that problem. Um, that can become, and combine that with two things. One is the voice as a new interface that we are sort of pioneering. And third is a planetary scale system that can handle all of this and remarkably work at a 99% plus efficiency. I mean, if the Indian, anything else in India, your water, electricity, um, your trade connections, bus connections, everything worked at efficiency of a UPI of the digital system that works here, would actually look far better than a developed country, right? Highly, highly efficient systems. Uh, it's remarkable how living in the middle of all this insanity, you've been actually able to build something that's really world-class. With that, I'll just say a few things. Uh, these are my key takeaways for people who are, you know, data science is sort of the sexy job today. Uh, a lot of people aspire to go do data science and a lot of people do data, want to do data science for the sake of data science. Um, I'd say just starting. Next 10 to 15 years, you know, uh, I keep joke, keep joke, keep joking to people saying that I'm highly employable for next 20 years now. It's just starting, we are not even seeing 1% of applications in business, right? And literally, it can bring billions and billions of dollars in prosperity and upside. And genuine well-being of human. Not only the upside, but genuine well-being of human. Imagine not, you know, instead of having to wait for 45 minutes 
at a um, in a call center, you're not able to get the answer in two minutes, right? And be on the way. Um, there is a second insight here is that there's a massive opportunity for what I call is a solving is India class problem, right? It's complex, it's incomplete, often in card data, needs a lot of patience and time. You actually have to be, so just so that you know, I came back uh, in India, uh, first time I came back for a brief period, went back, but second time when I came back in 2015, I have actually done, I could write my own book, you know, my own motorcycle diary. I've actually gone in behind a motorcycle about 6,000 kilometers, right? And delivered packages in 3,000 houses. Um, so that I can understand how things work, right? And it's a funny anecdote I'll give because I do have, looks like other two, three minutes extra that I planned for. When I landed in Delhi, um, I am a Bengali who grew up in Northeast. I went to IIT Bombay briefly where no one speaks Hindi. And then been in Maryland and Northeast, US Northeast, Maryland, Boston, New York, and California. So my Hindi Northeast, when I grew up in Northeast India, they never taught Hindi. So my Hindi was very, very basic. Like I could, the only Hindi I had ever encountered with is in TV, right? So I land there and I said, look, I'm going to go now, go deliver. So they said, look, given your American accent and all of that stuff, you really, do you really want to do that? And then said, okay, fine, you pick the idea you want to do. So I had no idea about Delhi and you know, I don't know why I landed in Delhi. So I looked at the map and I found an area called Mukherjee Nagar. And I said, Mukherjee has to be a Bengali area. You land up and Mr. Bhatia, who is a Punjabi from Delhi would laugh. Mukherjee Nagar is where Punjabi immigrants settled after the independence. It was named as a colony in Shama Prasad Mukherjee's name. You go in there and the only thing they speak is Punjabi. Uh, and the only thing I speak is uh, Bengali Hindi, right? So it's a funny anecdote, but this is essentially my first interaction with figuring out how India really, really works, right? And um, and so on. And so and the, so understanding the problems, right? I'll give you one last example because this is my last slide. Um, so quickly, I have a couple of minutes, right? We have six forty-five issue, um, seven forty-five issue. So for example, if you look at your uh, and I'll give you an example for the young people who are here in India, you have two large e-commerce apps. Amazon and Flipkart, right? So when you buy a refrigerator, what did you all do all searches? You know that you need a 120 liter refrigerator, double door, it's, um, um, you know, you have frost free, five star energy and all this stuff, right? You check all of that stuff and then probably aluminum, flushed aluminum door and all that stuff. When you've done all of that, you go to a shop called Pi Electronics, one of the shops in uh, Bangalore, to actually go stand in front of you, see how it opens, how the drawer is on, and you have no intention of purchasing from there, right? You walk in, uh, the person who is a salesperson, and he says, sir, do you need any help? He said, no, just looking for fridges. He knows that I'm not making the purchase, so he doesn't waste your time. As I'm stepping out, he only says two things to me. He said, sir, we match Amazon's price, and instead of the fridge getting in three days later, I can deliver you tomorrow morning. And if anything happens, you have my mobile number. Amazon, you have to call the call center and wait for two, you know, two hours. At which point he's made the deal, right? He just spends 30 seconds making that deal. Doesn't waste any time on it. They go to a place south of Bangalore called Holy Mom. And this is where, you know, there's a small store. There are people who are coming down um, from an auto, you understand, you can see that they're wearing traditional clothes, um, local people, right? It's a rural area. It's the last sort of rural outpost in the border. The person comes in, right? This, the whole family comes in to look at a refrigerator, right? Not one guy. The same sales guy asks them a question that tells you what India problems are all about. And, you know, I'll just tell you what the question is. First question he asks them is not what type of refrigerator, double door, frost cream, et cetera. He asked them a question, how many people in the family? Right? Because he knows that their capabilities is 15 to 20,000 rupees, not beyond that. He knows that they don't need that extra wide drawer for keeping Coke. No one keeps Coke in rural areas. He's trying to give them the best feature in the 15,000 price set, right? Now, if you are going to go build a search engine within your app in India for the next billion, which I spoke about, not the first 300 billion, you have to figure out how do you ask the question, how many people in the family? As opposed to doing your search by liters, you know, frost free, double door, et cetera. Unless you have cracked the first questions, you're not going to get the customers. 
And understanding that first question is extremely hard. And that's why I'm talking about, right? It can generate ideas of a product service and automation that you haven't seen in anywhere else in the world. All right, I'll keep my mouth shut. I have taken 46 minutes, Shukriti. I've taken one minute of your time, but uh, happy to go into the Q&A. Right, thank you, Shantanu, so much. Uh, that was a really great, uh, you know, bird's eye view of what the complexities are uh, today of data science um, and the AI systems. Uh, and I and I really want to, uh, you know, I, I think of this as a as an Indian problem right now that we tend to blame things very frequently, you know. Uh, so, for example, when you gave that example of uh, we can buy two tomatoes and we can scan a barcode, uh, you know, two years from now we didn't have access to that technology and right now if i go to my uh, you know vegetable vendor and if that does not happen if his google pay is not working or something i i start blaming the internet yeah data nahi chalta hai ye nahi hota you know so how easily we get adapted to things although it's such a complex problem to solve right so um, so it's it's very interesting to hear from you things which seem trivial uh, like an address which is a big problem for a company like delivery who is into you know, delivering things. So uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, Manish, I would invite your thoughts and then we would quickly open up for questions from the audience. So I, thank you very much, Dr. Shantanu, for spending time with us. I think that kind of glimpse uh, on the AI and the machine learning you gave this evening is, is absolutely brilliant. You know, you talked about the massive data generation every day, which leads to obviously the data analytics because we need to look at the data and figure out how do we interpret it uh, in terms of reducing the cost or maybe you know the optimizing the efficiencies and and all that needs wonderful people like you who can work on the data and take it to the next level you know you talked about a very interesting real life uh, examples obviously and one example on the upi which you talked about doctor i can add to my story very recently in december month i i traveled from bombay to goa by car and came back, it was a week's trip and trust me, even for the coffee on the way or petrol or the sugar cane juice, everywhere we paid through the Google Pay. Not even a rupees cash, the hotel and food and everything literally. So UPI has really done a wonderful job, I think, and people have understood the value of that part and that's the reason the massive generation or digitization which is happening uh, you know, we thought that people like you can really give us the glimpse of the opportunity. It also told us, sir, uh, dear talk in the last slide, opportunity space in this, in this area. The AI and the machine learning ability to solve the problem. And you talked about 15, 20 years next, maybe longer, right? So thank you very much for, for sharing that perspective with us. And I'm sure, uh, you know, our colleagues and the friends who are on this call or the webinar today will take that opportunity tip from you and explore more, you know, in that area. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I really appreciate and I, I let it, uh, you know, be on the question and answer we should keep. To you. I will make one statement that I tell people. I said, sir. thank God this pandemic was not in 2016. It would be such a difficult world yeah. without all of this working in the background. You don't realize how easy you are handling the pandemic because the entire digital infrastructure is working. Everything yeah. from Arugu Setu, Coin, your other card, your UPI. If yeah. the pandemic was just five years back, we would be in a very, very different situation. Very right. Very right. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Because the tech infrastructure saved all of us. Otherwise, I don't know, five, ten years back, what could happen? Yeah, absolutely. Great. So, should we can take the questions? You know, please, uh, please start with the question and answer session. Sure. Uh, so we have a question from Abhijit. Abhijit, can you uh, uh, pose the question? Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Bhattacharya. Indeed, it was a great talk. I'm Abhijit from Calcutta. I have a couple, two questions for you. Means one is in the various applications that you spoke about, both the computer vision and the NLP based applications, and especially from the indie languages that we are getting into. We would require massive amounts of ground truth data in order to train our supervised learning systems and stuff. So, and that, that's, I feel that's a Herculean task in order to get the good quality, consistent ground truth data. So how do you, uh, uh, means how are you planning to address that gap? That's one question. And the second question is regarding the address issues and the various address issues that you were talking about that within a precision of three kilometers, we can get the Google map and stuff. 
do you see an emerging area of gis based analytics in the spatial data science area in order to get a very specific mapping area emerging in this country to get that address issue okay. i'll take uh, both these questions abhijit first of all there is no shortcut for the first one right which is how do you get ground truth data my guess is that only about 10% of the data is actually valuable um, and you just have to know which 10% it is the only way to do that is essentially sit down and sift through the one of the things that data scientists do extremely poorly at least in india is that they don't want to go look at the data source data themselves right to them saying that you know we have actually created a system uh, that's probably out of our it you know um, services legacy which is called the you know the quality people so one of the first things i had to really fight after coming here when i talked to the data scientist and i said look you need to look at the quality of the data yourself and their first answer always was no no there's a data quality team they look at it unless you as a data scientist don't spend time looking at the data and actually going out and understanding the context of the data yourself you never be able to build a data you know data science model so there's no shortcut to it the reason most of the indian companies or indian startups including unicorns haven't been able to build good quality data science team is largely because of their reluctance to go and you know understand the market right understand the market understand the users it's just like anything else right understand their context and understand what's happening in real life why do they do certain things in certain ways right so there's no two ways about it and we do have a large amount of people who are you know not necessarily top notch data scientist but also understand the context very well so using them in that um in that uh, situation would be actually a better way to go cleanse the data so for example you know, look at the ground truth of the data so for example gps data 10% of the gps data in the country is correct right because of the low end phone it will shut off the gps and it's done triangulation and all so if you build either a system where the data scientists themselves are looking at it and enforce it and then based on their learning build a system that can sort of train other people that's one way to handle it the second question i actually didn't understand you said there can be a gi based gis based analytics uh, yeah. there are tons of gis based analytics companies in the country but they suffer from the same problem right um uh, which is um the accuracy is something that they do not consider in uh, their um i guess in the endeavor right which is they will mm -hmm. do an analysis without understanding what that analysis really means so i'll give an example there's a gs company when i first saw um in uh, the thing they were doing a 90 crore contract with government of india so we saw said that delivery that will go take it you know their data sets so what happened is we gave them 10000 data right and they resolved all of them uh and they resolved all of them in 10000 data sets and they resolved uh, 10000 data sets from delhi into one lat log which is delhi 00 which is rashtrapati bhavan so if we because people didn't understand what the context was if we had delivery if delivery had used their service pranav da pranav mukherjee would have gotten 6000 packages every day and returned about 4000 every day because all delhi addresses are just resolved to one building right so if you don't understand the context talking about gis or in the fancy term is actually not useful mm -hmm. Did I give you the right answer? I yeah, think yeah. I'm... No, no, I was just asking because most of the AV companies who are working on their autonomous vehicles, they are creating their own mapping teams internally. I know. I mean, they are creating their own maps and stuff. So do Correct. you see uh, separate mapping teams coming out from maybe Airtel or from other flip cards of the world uh, who so are creating their AI mapping. applications? Okay. So we all have our mapping team and we all keep oh. it internal because oh. that's a massive, okay. massive advantage in our business, right? So delivery has very little incentive when it knocks down the cost by 22% just doing one thing, right? It has zero incentive to sort of go uh, and ask, you know, go and give it to anyone else. Okay. Oh, got it. Hmm. Thank you. So, so Kriti, you are on mute. Yeah. Uh, Deep, uh, uh, may I invite, invite you to ask the next question, please? Thank you, Mr. Sena. Uh, first of all, Mr. Bhattacharya, thank you for the great session. Uh, I speak from the narrative of a small business owner right now. Uh, of course, overlapping with Rahul's questions in the comments, that we do not have deep pockets to create our own tools or our own systems. So at this point of time, how is it that we can work on two fronts? One, uh, in the 
small or the narrow context of improving our efficiency do we currently stick to open source uh, ai or ml tools or do we uh, sort of you know just wait to get bigger and build our internal teams that can help there and secondly even if we can't do that how is it that we can briefly work or rather share the data sets that we have on ground and contribute to the larger uh, tech building activity and nation building activity so there are a couple of good ways right the first one is actually an interesting question i struggle with that um, a lot right because it's you know to me it does not seem fair that large companies big tech companies are collecting all the data as big tech companies have the, all the tools they have also the they can also pay, pay the ml engineers 300000 dollars a day in india and again get better bigger and better at the expense of other it's, it will not sustain them in the long run two things one is the open source movement is a counter to that and most of your initial gains as a small company will come from open source if today you are using zero ai versus even a limited model so for example if you are someone who is selling fruit and you want to use a you know vision model to inspect the fruits to figure out the best ones from the the automatic grading system right you can build one actually pretty easily from an open source and it's actually i uh, looked at the data the it's about 80% cheaper than doing it manually so you can get disproportionate gains so one of the good things that happened is that most of the model is not the issue right anymore models are being built by google stanford's of the world so think of that someone is you know india has the data which is the oil the refineries are being built by the googles and the stanford's of the world which is the refinery for oil right and if and the refineries are, if the difference is the refineries are being given away for free so if we spend the time processing that data and make oil out of it it's actually pretty valuable so that's the open source uh, stack is a good way to go that the second question your second question is how do you contribute data to the national effort actually i don't have a good answer for that i mean the there has been some pretty good uh, efforts in data.gov.in uh, in collecting the data but that's not a national effort in terms of collecting all other kinds of data it's a limited, very limited field of data it's highly highly decentralized between say universities like iis so for example there is a national stack getting built for smart cities um, if you send me an email uh, you can you quickly you can share my email address on the chat happy to answer one on one it's a longer one and i think we want to give probably i'm here to stay i can stay here for longer i have no issues if there are more questions uh, but i can uh, this one will take a little bit longer time i can give you an answer for i can point you in the right direction no worries at all we'll connect offline thank you That's, or you just reach out to me on linkedin i usually reply all the time already done sir perfect wonderful uh, thanks deep um, so anilesh has a question uh, sandhu his question is that you know uh, when we are talking from the technology perspective to solve an issue uh, how can we find a way so that tech adoption is not at the cost of job reduction but leads to involvement of more people because uh, unless that will be more sustainable okay so my challenge my answer for all of this has actually been um, more or less uh, same all along which is that look no one knows right so for example in computer scape in india right um, a lot of uh, you know and i know people who had uh, been much more senior to me and came the early days of computerization in the um, in the in in different parts of india right there were um, you know unions everywhere and especially in the bengal and other areas who were totally against the computerization right but as a result of that so typically tech has so far been able to increase the total size of the pie for everyone instead of keeping the size of the pie same and taking away a big chunk of it so i would not worry about it because tax manifestation has been in such a ways see the jobs will have to get higher and you know what it's a higher grade and better like you no longer if you are uh, if you build your career for example of being a new york city hotsbuggy writer when the car came in there was a massive you know like protest right um, they were vandalizing cars they were saying the cars are poisonous there are stories about if you go more than 20 miles an hour you will die from your internal organ exploding all of that stuff right but the automobile industry is one of the biggest industries in the world today right much bigger than the hotspur industry so technology has always led to sort of a bigger pie for everyone and whether it trend goes in the future forever i don't know but this is something one is almost inevitable and second um 
I would not worry about trying to stop it and redirect it because no one knows a priori what the technology, what direction the technology will take us towards, right? So for example, if there's tomorrow a miracle cancer drug, when you take a drop of it and it cures all forms of cancer, you're not going to stop it by saying, but what happens to all the cancer doctors, oncologists, you know, radiation guys and all of that, right? You will take that, you know, miracle drop and not worry about, you know, the greater good is here serving, serving everyone's life, right? That's been my general answer. Not the best answer, but I stick to that line or that belief. Thank, thank you, sir. Thanks for your answer. Uh, just, uh, uh, just to add up to this question again, uh, actually in developed countries, uh, they, they, uh, like, they don't have, you know, uh, they mostly have shortage of people. But in India, the case is completely different, right? So they want to automate things because they don't get uh, uh, like uh, uh, people uh, to do all the jobs, but here in India the situation is completely opposite. So when we talk about uh, automating everything, uh, right? So uh, should we not find uh, uh, that balance uh, wherein more people could be utilized? Uh, should we not start in that way, where along with technology more people can be involved? Yeah, so I think I think people are conscious of that, right? So, for example, the example I gave, right? Um, you know, uh, the figuring out. I spent a lot of time in the food belt. You know, I spent time. You know, the uh, professor I work with at uh, at MIT, Professor Ramesh Ruskar, one of the legendary guys. He's out of Nasik. He's out of uh, Nasik, and that is Nasik produces India's you know good chunk of India's onion, right? So you would actually see the problem with non-automatic, right? A third of India's produces, right, uh, rot between the field and to your store because of lack of automation, because of lack of refrigeration, because of lack of proper transportation, which is not optimized and all of that. So one could go and argue saying that, look, the current system, you know, lets 35% rot and as a result of that, farmers are poor forever, right? So how do you draw the balance? If you can, for example, when I was in Nasik last year, April last, I saw someone uh, a young lady, she was like 22, 23, figuring out a detector which was able to detect uh, eight days before anything else, humans could, uh, that the onion is going to rot. And they're able to save a lot of onions from getting rotten, right? So that's, you can say that, look, humans can go and smell this and by the time they know they can you know, save this, right? But it, to me, that's an example of an automation, right? So the balance always lies, how do you make it perfect? Uh, it's always, you know, a combination of what does it cost to do it? Um, does it save more money and can that money, see, just because you're automating and saving money doesn't mean that money is going to someone's pocket, right? A lot of this automation actually goes into expanding businesses. So, for example, if you are able to sort out your uh, fruits that are going rotten in a grocery store faster, what you're able to do now, you're able to sell it earlier maybe do a discounting and so on and so forth. You're preventing a lot of spillage and wastage. You are also able to take that money and now probably uh, afford that, you know, spend that money on getting like strawberries and other stuff, right? So I would not, eventually the businesses make those decisions and it's not all about just let's make automation and let's, uh, you know, let's take everything in our pocket. It usually doesn't work that way because if they keep doing it at some point in time, it doesn't work, right? So, Wonderful. Uh, I think we are already over time, uh, Shantanu, and uh, I really want to be mindful of everybody's time because it's a Saturday evening. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions which can be taken uh, on you know one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, so I would encourage people to connect with Shantanu either on LinkedIn or maybe on his uh, email address and probably he can answer those questions. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this enlightening session, Sandhanu. Uh, it was a pleasure having you on the platform. Welcome back to the university in, in, a, in a way. Uh, and we hope to have a lot more inputs from you. Uh, while we also build our systems, we want to work with you, uh, you know, on a more closer basis. So we can talk about that offline as well. Uh, Manish, uh, your closing thoughts and we can close this. So I have, you know, I'm really indebted to Dr. Shantanu. Thank you very much for taking time out. Really appreciate it. And I'll definitely connect with you, doctor, next week, you know, depending upon your convenience to figure out, you know, how we can, how we can leverage more on your knowledge and accumulated experience. Thank you very much, doctor.
and thank you every much everyone on on the call this this evening i really appreciate the time and efforts thank you have a good thank you time. have a good day thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you.